Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, the aim today is to give an overview. Obviously, this is the introduction to a set of five other webinars and also a seminar. And the seminar also, will also be given in uh, uh, online. But today is the is the overview. Today is the introduction. What we're trying to do is to give you, just as it says here, basic ideas, basic ideas just to set you off thinking about uh, people development and also give you some simple ideas early on on how to go about increasing knowledge and skills. And we'll expand on what we mean by knowledge and skills and the like later on. What we're talking about here is the management of the process. We're not talking about the actual skills themselves. In a sense, it's how do we know what knowledge and skills? How do we know what we have to train in, what we have to develop in? Um, and how do we go about the management of that process? So what I'm not going to be talking about is actually giving over any specific skills, for example, like the, 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 the um, very common one of time management. I'm not interested in that. If time management is an issue, then it will come up as something, a knowledge stroke skill that someone needs. I'm more interested in the management of the process. Uh, the actual form of training we'll talk about uh, later on. And training, of course, is an intervention. It's, it's something that interrupts a person's normal activity. They're normally getting on with things and we want to effect change. So we're coming along and introducing, we're, we're intervening in that person's life in order to effect that change. And so all forms of training and development are forms of intervention. Other interventions might be things like uh, leadership itself is a form of intervention, uh, and so is, for example, coaching and, and mentoring. So we're here at the individual level, at the person level. We're not trying to uh, take a whole, uh, we will take a whole company very shortly, but it will still be at the individual level. And we're looking at changing the outcomes. So if we're changing the outcomes for a person, we're changing the performance that the person's going to realize, then we need to know a lot about the what 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 links to that performance? What makes the person perform? Because if we can't actually understand what makes the person perform, then we can't change it. It's as simple as that. Now, just at this point, I'll I'll briefly digress and say you'll find most of this stuff in the workbook. Um, certainly, page two of the workbook. Uh, most of the slides that are important are there, and also on page one of the workbook, you'll find the uh, one of the key diagrams. Uh, which is kind of sorting out what it's all about, but we'll come to that. Those of you who've been on other webinars, those of you who've been on seminars in the past, you'll have seen us build this diagram. Um, for us, it's a very, very key diagram because it tries to say upon what outcomes for the individual depend. And... If we can determine those outcomes, we can determine the performance upon which those outcomes depend. We can then look at, and you're looking here at this diagram working backwards, we can say what the performance is. We can then say what the behavior required is. That then tells us something about the way in which the person and the degree to which the person will be motivated. And of course, you'll hear us often say that the greatest motivator that anybody has is the job they do. So we start from the job, then the job motivates, the motivation creates behavior, the behavior creates performance, the performance creates outcomes. And that's a nice linear thing. Until we throw in all the other variables, which are really important to us, when we start to talk about people development. I'm not going to talk about leadership and culture today. That's Those are subjects for other times. Uh, just to note that they influence motivation. Motivation is also influenced by personality and the person's in implicit and explicit motives. Um, not so worried about that when it comes to um, learning and development and, and uh, development of people. What I am very interested in is perhaps changing behavior through people development. So 
I certainly could be interested in in changing the personal tools that somebody uses. So, for example, the ability to actually, uh, let's be silly and say, get up in the morning, get themselves in for work and dedicate themselves to a day's work. That actually is a personal um, a, a tool that is 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 to the is is dependent on the person, and it may be that that's to be learned. Now, it could be that that is something that has to be talked about and developed. It could also be that personal tools might be the ability to dedicate oneself to a task. Um, we're not talking here about skills and knowledge in a sense. We're talking about those core personal tools. Um, so it could be that we're interested in training on those. Self-efficacy and self-esteem less, less so because that, of course, comes from, um, from experience and the likes. But on the other hand, that also the more, we co more competent we are, the, the higher those are. So it, that brings us really to the big area of interest for people development, and that is in the performance. The skills and knowledge, the experience, the intelligence, which we'll talk about, and one element of personality, conscientiousness. But then even focusing down further, we're really talking about giving the person the skills and the knowledge, and as I said, maybe the personal tools, but the skills and knowledge in order to be able to do a job. So that's where we're at. That's why we're trying to do it. And everything we do will be focused on that. So in order to make sense of this, we really need to ask the question, what helps people learn? How is it that somebody learns those skills and, and knowledge? How is it that somebody can actually change their behavior through training? What helps them learn? And the fact is that some people learn quicker than others. Some people learn in one fashion and others prefer a different fashion. Um, and it's that, of course, the, the understanding of what helps people learn helps us design appropriate training interventions. Because if we don't get the, uh, the, the intervention that suits the person, then prospectively that will be less successful as a training intervention. So what does help people learn? Well, the first thing, and we've got four things down here, intelligence, Gen S, personality and preferences. So well, let's go through and, and understand what they are. Intelligence, let's take it as we, as we all understand it, um, but it's also as a psychologist, it's psychology concept, it's a thing called general mental ability. And if you want to get to what the psychologists call it, G, um, and general mental ability intelligence is primarily what's well, thought of as being part of three things ability fundamentally the ability to reason in abstract terms with concepts with words verbal reasoning and with numbers numeric reasoning so and and the typically the intelligence first of all Intelligence is what we get through our genes, but also there's an element of intelligence and we can split intelligence another way and say there is, um, there is uh, crystallized intelligence and there is the innate intelligence that we're born with. So we can actually build an element of our intelligence. Now, unfortunately, we can't become better. We, can't, we can learn some techniques for abstract reasoning, but abstract reasoning is fundamentally innate. It's what we're born with. We either can abstract reason, we can reason in concepts, or we find that a bit more difficult. We can learn some of the tools. If we're not good at it, then we can learn some of the tools. Of course, if we are uh, naturally good at it, then we can learn tools and be even better. But the point really is that abstract reasoning, if you're poor on it and the job requires abstract reasoning, you're probably in the wrong job. Um, and that's one of the tests you would make when you actually recruit people. But the verbal and numeric can actually be built. So the first thing is them that have got better intelligence, a bit more bright, tend to learn more easily. So that's the first thing. But we have to remember that elements of intelligence can also be built. Growth needs strength. Now, growth needs strength is an interesting one. Growth needs strength is socially constructed. It's the strength of your growth need. It's the strength of the thing that drives you to grow. You want more. You want to learn. And it's the strength of that drive within you. Now, you can take a class of school kids 
with one teacher and that teacher can build a high growth need strength in all those kids and you can give them to another teacher and actually the growth need strength is not so high that is to say Growth needs strength is actually what they call socially constructed. Uh, it's not something you're born with. You actually get it. You build that. So if you're in an environment where everybody's learning together and there is a culture of, of high growth, then people will tend to latch onto that and, and themselves drive for growth. So you need to have you need to recognize. And of course, if somebody comes to you with a low growth need strength, actually you're going to have a hard time improving it, particularly if the environment is not one of, uh, of um, high, uh, high expectation of growth. So be aware of that when you can get people who have quite low growth need strength and you wonder why they don't latch on to growth and they don't latch on to developing. Part of it might be that simply they have a very low growth need strength. It's just not them. Um, personality also has an effect, particularly the uh, those of you who are up on personality. You've got uh, um, the uh, ac the acronym CANU, which is uh, um, the O in CANU is openness to new ideas. That is the big five um, definition of personality, and O is openness to new ideas. People who are, tend to be not not so open to new ideas. Obviously, you're trying when you're trying to train somebody, when you're trying to develop someone, they are you're trying to say to them, hey, look, I've got these new ideas for you. Um, they're good for you. You should you should learn. You should take those on board. If they've got an op low openness to new ideas, it's not going to be particularly uh, useful and you're going to have a hard job in getting them to learn. And then preferences. And I suppose this preferences link back to uh, implicit and explicit motives, the person's own individual motive. And take, for example, artistic um, there. So you see them, the, the six there, and you take artistic. If someone is not has not a high preference for artistic activities um, and embracing the arts, then you send them on an artistic, you know, something like a music appreciation course, and they probably shrug their shoulders and say, I don't really understand why I'm here. They don't have an an interest in it, um, and uh, and so it's useful if, of course, they are if they're going to be in a sales environment. Let's say they should have high in social interest. They should be high in interacting with people, for example. Uh, otherwise, they're probably not going to take most out, a lot out of the training. So there are some ideas about what helps people learn. And you can see there that you've got to understand something about the person before you start sending them on courses and designing courses for them. You have to understand a bit about who they are and how they want to learn and how best, therefore, you can, uh, you can cause that learning. Um, a little bit just briefly about competencies and behaviors. I talked about knowledge and skills. Really, I prefer to be with competencies and behaviors um, because those are the two that are, that are, it's, it, that are we're going to specify ultimately. I'll come to this in a moment. <coughs> going to specify in a job description. So it's those that we actually want to deal with. Competencies are simply knowledge, knowledge times skills. Excuse me a moment. That's just the um, the cough button. Uh, <laughs> um, so knowledge and skills are competencies, and of course behaviours you learn from from uh, um, from experience and the like. So um, so how do we know? How do we know what we are going to try to train in? What? How do we know what we're going to develop the person in? Well, the first place to look is in the job description. Now. Unfortunately, most people in the UK have got very poor job descriptions. They've got job descriptions that are lists of duties. They are not built right. They've got to be built right in the first place. Typically, a good job description would have half a, half a dozen accountabilities, responsibilities, built as do something to something to achieve a result. So you could have something like, for example, um, define the products to be developed for the uh, fire and rescue market um, in order to achieve um, 
targeted uh, revenues of, let's say, £10 million per annum. So we know exactly what the person's trying to do. And we can now start to say, well, if that's what they have to do, what competencies and behaviours do they have to have? What do they have to be competent in? And how do they have to do what they do? So we can define things. As soon as we can define things, then we can start to say, well, do they do that? Have they got that? Do they understand that? Are they able to do that? And of course, if no, then there's a gap. Therefore, there's something to be developed. If yes, celebrate, move on to something where they're not quite so good. Um, and so the job description is the starting point, the essential starting point, but not the only starting point. I'll come to that. Um, the most important starting point that we have, the job description. So we need some very good job descriptions in the first place. Um, but uh, there are other ways of getting over that. And I'll talk a bit about that in a few mo's. So um, we also just in talking about how we know, um, we also need to just briefly touch on the difference perhaps between doing something and knowing how to think about something. Now, I've put the fire brigade, typically fire brigade, they spend most of their time training. And there are one or two um, other examples of people like this are football teams. Uh, clearly, England didn't spend enough time training. Um, <laughs> um, and you've got people like, for example, special forces patrols, they work together, they work in a close-knit group, and they spend more time training than they do doing. There are then another group, which I suppose in the other sense, the group of managers here, where I'm saying that you need to teach them to think. Now, if you teach somebody to think, what you need to do is to give them all the methods and models and all the knowledge behind the subject uh, whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is, but you need to teach them a lot about the background to the subject and the way of doing, the way of thinking and the, the tools that they can use to do what you're asking in the job description. So you have to be quite careful here. In a lot of roles, it's about teaching people to do something. And in other roles, it's teaching them to think so that they can do things. And there's two distinct differences there. And uh, for those of you up in uh, The Lion King, this is Scar here singing the Be Prepared song as he lectures the hyenas. And uh, he says, be prepared. And, of course, the hyenas flip back saying, for what? You know, they say, yeah, we'll be prepared. For what? Now, one of the things that's become clear in some of our work is that many companies for many companies, people do the job description, they learn the right things, they do it in the right way. It's all pretty static. And yet that's not good enough. They desperately want to be able to be ready for the day when someone says, are you able to do this? And they can instantly say yes, without then saying, but we'll have to spend a year retraining our people. So there's also a, a desire, there's a a bit of an impetus there coming from managers to want to be able to meet opportunities. Now, opportunities are things you don't currently do. If you don't currently do them, they're not in current job descriptions. And that, therefore, is a task. It's a, a management task to be able to identify what to train in if people don't have those particular competencies and behaviors in their present job description and yet they're wanted because the company wants to be able to meet opportunities. And we'll talk about this as we go along in, in some of the other uh, um, webinars. So just wrapping things up there, I've got a couple of things. The mechanism here, the most important mechanism of all of this is the competency framework. And we'll do more of this later on. The most basic competency framework, and incidentally, you can get this on our website, um, it uses what's called Bartram's Great Eight competencies, and you'll see them around the outside, things like analyzing and interpreting. Now, the concept behind a competency framework is very simple. The gray is, so you see the graticule there coming out in radial rings. So you've got one, two, three, four, four rings. 
you've got trainee, supervised practitioner, practitioner and expert, four levels. And presently, this particular person has been rated, and I don't mean rated in a performance appraisal sense, I mean, been rated as being competent in, for example, they are at the trainee level when it comes to analyzing and interpreting. Whereas they are at the practitioner level when it comes to organizing and executing. So what we've done is in conjunction with the, the job holder, we said, look, where are you at on this? And they've said, look, the job requires me, and this is the yellow, the job requires me to be a practitioner in analyzing and interpreting things in the job. I am only a trainee. That yellow that I see is my gap. And that's what I need to bridge. I need to go from trainee to practitioner. And we take another example, uh, creating and conceptualizing. We need to come from supervised practitioner to practitioner. We'll go through this in more detail. If you're interested, go on the website. It's there. You can fiddle with it and uh, play to your heart's content. So the, the personal competency framework there just at the level normally you wouldn't have those standard eight normally you would have specific stuff to jobs or stuff specific to job but it's it's good that there's eight there and that it's a way of of uh, of looking at the world that there are only in any job there are only eight basic competencies um it's it's up to you whether you adopt this approach or whether you actually write competencies for every single job. That's a, a different discussion. And then if we take this to the, the PAN organization, okay, what does this look like across a 50, a 50 man, 50 person organization? And you can't see it particularly well. It's not, uh, don't really want to spend time going through the words, but what we've got here um, is a matrix. We've got um, columns which show us things like, for example, the competency required. The second column in, in is the competency required. Importantly, the third one in is where did that competency come from? You can't just invent a competency. It either comes from a job description or in this particular case, it came from policies. It came from an operational management plan and it came from, strat from the overall organizational strategy. So we have to know why we want that competency. Then what we've got is the level of competency that it would require, column, column four. Then there's a bunch of columns there which are about the people that we've got. For example, you'll see there specialists, engineers, even at the director level in this particular case. And we're saying, yes, they need it. No, they don't. Uh, and then some ideas uh, in the later columns to do with how we get there. But the important point is that we've got a matrix. We've got something like 50 or 60 discrete competencies. Not everybody has them in their job description. Not every, They're not needed for everyone, but they're there on the whole organization. We can look at who needs them, which jobs need them, and we can look at what the, uh, the planned development is. And that gives us a whole company, a whole organization competency framework. And that one, that particular one is for a 50 man group. Um, and you can see the detail that you would go to if you were going to do a complete organizational competency framework to start planning, where are we today? with the, the, the gray, if you like, of the, of the previous slide. Where are we today? Where do we need to be with this particular person and their competencies? And then, of course, management is about, well, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to actually plan those interventions? And we'll be saying a lot more about that um, in, uh, in the next five webinars and ultimately the seminar that ends it. So there we go. Oh, quick question, quick one. I've forgotten a slide. Are we there yet? Yeah. How do we know we're not just going to plow on and on and on? Those of you who've been to other things would recognize this. The feedback control loop, it's basically, are we getting the performance? Are we getting those outcomes? Is the actual performance what we want? Is it the reference performance? And if you compare the two and there's an error in the, in the systems, uh, uh, systems output. And this is what the manager's going through. This is in the manager's head, if you like. So you've got the actual performance, the reference performance. Am I seeing what I want? Yes. Do nothing. Am I seeing what I want? No, there's an error. 
that prompts me to do something. I go to my intervention, I go to my training repertoire, I, I build a, a training intervention and I deliver it and then see whether or not it works. So that's the, the concept. We're constantly feeding back and testing. So there we are. Um, that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. And um, at that point, I will hand back to Sue. <laughs>